Uh, welcome everybody to the webinar. I can see in the attendee list many uh, familiar names, so it's lovely to see everybody here. I just um, get my screen sharing happening here. So, can everyone see my presentation okay? Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so as Regan mentioned, my name's Millie Formby and I work for BirdLife Australia as a project officer as part of the Migratory Shorebird Program. And tonight I'll be speaking to you about migratory shorebirds. And by the end of the talk, I hope I will have convinced you that shorebirds are the most awesome birds in the world, not bias or anything. But uh, exactly what is a shorebird? That's a good question. So shorebirds are a group of bird species that can't land on water like seagulls and other seabirds. And they're commonly referred to as waders because they're most often seen wading around wetlands on mud flats and into tidal areas to feed. And they have fantastic names like godwits, curlews, pratt and coals, dint snipe, knots, sandpipers, plovers and avocets. And in Australia, there's over 50 species of shorebirds and 37 of those are migratory. And that means that these 37 species fly all the way to the Northern Hemisphere every year to breed, except for one species, which I don't actually have pictured here, which is a bit of a, an oversight, um, the double-banded plover. So that one flies from Australia to New Zealand each year. It's the only east to west migrant and it breeds in New Zealand during our summer. We also have 18 resident species of shorebirds that are present in Australia year round and they breed on Australian shores as well. And Silas will be talking about a few of those species later tonight. So where can you find shorebirds? They occur in a wide variety of different habitat types, although most species associate with wetlands and coastal areas. So some prefer uh, more freshwater habitats, while others will prefer more coastal areas, whether they be rocky or sandy beaches and uh, intertidal and mud and sand flats, whereas others prefer more, oops, that's timed out. Uh, others prefer more estuarine intermediate habitats or grasslands and even inland salt lakes. The migratory species spend most of their time here in Australia during what we call their non-breeding season, which for us is from late spring to early autumn. So it's around six months of the year that they're here in Australia. Then around March, April, uh, they will take off on north migration and do this epic journey all the way up to the Arctic tundra to breed. And it's about 12 and a half thousand kilometers away. And the smaller species to undertake the journey is called the redneck stint, pictured here. It's only about, um, it only weighs as much as a piece of toast. So about 25 grams, this tiny little bird the size of a sparrow. And it can fly up to 5,000 kilometers in one go, which is pretty incredible. To get to the Arctic tundra, the shorebirds follow the East Asian Australasian flyway, which is pictured here in green on the right. And flyaway is just a fancy way of saying a bird migration highway. And there's eight global flyways in the world and the East Asian Australasian flyway has the most species and the highest number of individuals with uh, 6 million waders estimated to use the flyway every year. And as you can see, the EAAF, as we call it for short, it stretches all the way from the breeding grounds in Siberia and Alaska to uh, southwards all the way to Australia and New Zealand. And it encompasses 22 countries and about 4.5 billion people. So nearly half of the world's human population. So why do the birds fly all that way? Well, they arrive in the Arctic during summer in the Northern Hemisphere. So during our winter, so it was pretty much they're chasing an endless summer. And the Arctic's a really different place in the northern summer. So it's like 24 hours a day and the sea ice and the snow has melted into a wetland mosaic, which is really rich in food resources. And this image here just shows an aerial photo of the breeding grounds in the elastic, uh, elastic, uh, Alaskan Arctic tundra during the summer. 
So as I mentioned, tundra is an ideal place for breeding in the northern summer. So it's like 24 seven, which means it's really high productivity. And uh, you may be able to spot, there's actually a, a, a Pacific golden plover in the center of the image there, hiding in the vegetation. And there's also really few predators in the tundra. So this is a Terex sandpiper chick. And as you can see, uh, they're quite vulnerable because they're ground nesting birds. And the Arctic tundra provides a place where there's a few predators to prey on vulnerable eggs and chicks. And uh, long views as well that are free of trees and shrubs, which means predators can't sneak up on the birds very easily. There's also an abundance of food. So uh, clouds of mosquitoes um, provide ample food for growing chicks. And shorebirds are what we call uh, precocial, which means that when the chicks are born, they're actually able to feed themselves and not relying on mum and dad to come and bring them food. So the chicks uh, have a plentiful resource here in the form of uh, mosquitoes. Camouflage is also really essential to guard against predators. And some of the predators on the Arctic tundra include skewers, snowy owls and Arctic and red foxes. So the birds uh, have two different types of plumage. They have what we call breeding plumage and non-breeding plumage, and they molt into their breeding plumage uh, during this time of year so that they can camouflage uh, in that lichen and mosses and grasses, as you can see here in this image, while they're nesting. And their eggs are also very camouflaged, as you can see here. Uh, and the chicks are too, and uh, they, they blend right in with the mosses there, and they're also incredibly adorable. So the breeding cycle of shorebirds is uh, pretty hectic. It's very short, only lasts six weeks. So they fly all that way up there to have this crazy six week breeding cycle. So the birds arrive and then uh, the males will display to attract a mate and um, they have lecking territories. Uh, then they will mate and lay the eggs. Uh, either one or both of the parents will take turns at incubating the eggs. And then the eggs hatch after around 20 days. So there's very little time uh, before winter starts for a nesting, re-attempting re to nest if the eggs fail. So the parents will stay with the chicks for about three weeks after they're hatched and defend the chicks until they're fully grown. And then the parents uh, leave on migration before the chicks and head for the Southern Hemisphere. So at about six weeks old, the, the young have to leave and fly southward because uh, winter is coming and they will freeze. So they fly unaided all the way back to Australia. The adults arrive around September to October and the juveniles arrive from November onwards. And we actually don't know how the juveniles make it back here on their own because they're, they're not actually flying with the parents. Uh, and then the juveniles usually stay in Australia for a couple of years before they start making that uh, migratory journey back to the Arctic to breed themselves. And we call that overwintering. So how do we know all of this about shorebirds? Well, uh, in more recent years, we've been utilizing uh, satellite tracking technology. So in 2007, a group of uh, scientists from New Zealand fitted 16 bar-tailed godwits with satellite transmitters and were able to track their migration path. And featured here is the famous godwit E7. Uh, she was tracked flying all the way from New Zealand uh, up to China in the Yellow Sea, which was a 10,300 kilometre trip, which was pretty mind-blowing in itself. Uh, but then she just went one better and uh, after breeding in Alaska, flew 11,700 kilometers over nine days, nonstop, all the way across the Pacific Ocean from Alaska all the way to New Zealand. So it's um, the longest uh, nonstop flight for any uh, bird species. And it's uh, also the round trip of 30,000 kilometers that is traveled by Bartel Godwitz every year is the longest known uh, migration of any shorebird species. They're pretty amazing. And when you put that into a lifetime, 
We know from banding and flagging data that these birds live for 30 plus years. And if you're thinking they're flying 25 to 30,000 kilometers every year, that's about 680,000 kilometers in their lifetime, which is almost the distance from the earth to the moon and back just on migration alone. Uh, many of the shorebird species that I've spoken about are, are in decline and a major threat for that is uh, habitat loss through land reclamation in the Yellow Sea at China. So many of the mudflats around the Yellow Sea are being reclaimed for uh, development, ports and agriculture and such. And shorebirds are also hunted for food on the flyway as well as uh, being impacted by climate change and uh, avian flu and things like that. So there are decline for many species, but the species that rely on the Yellow Sea the most, like Eastern Curlew and Curlew Sandpiper, have been impacted uh, the most as well. So we've seen up to 80% declines in those two species over the past 40 years due to, for that reason. So places like the Hunter and Port Stevens and Manning River Estuary are really important uh, for shorebirds, especially considering that they spend most of their time here in Australia. So it's vitally important that we protect these areas. And up on the screen at the moment, I've just got uh, the group of species that are either nationally or internationally significant for the hunter estuary. So there are 11 species in total. So if a species is considered to be internationally significant, that means that uh, one percent or more of the total flyway population uh, has been uh, counted or surveyed in that particular site. So more than one percent of the total flyway population has been present or is present in the Hunter Estuary for Red Knot, Eastern Curlew and Sharp-tailed Sandpiper. And the species along the top row and bottom row, they're nationally significant here in the Hunter, which means that there have been 0.1% of the total flyway population observed for those species. So we've got Latham snipe, Bartel godwit, Blacktail godwit, green shanks, curly sandpiper, double banded plover, wimbrel, and Pacific golden plover are nationally significant. And some of the other species that are regularly seen here in the Hunter include marsh sandpiper, uh, redneck stint, ruddy turnstone, terex sandpiper, and occasionally we get the pectoral sandpiper, a sandaling and wood sandpiper pop up as well. So now that I've convinced you that shorebirds are totally awesome, I can assume that you'd only like to go and see some shorebirds yourself in your local area. And uh, these are the best spots to see them in the Hunter Estuary. So around uh, Stockton Sandspit, so if you're familiar with Stockton Bridge on the northern side of Stockton Bridge, under the bridge is an area called so Stockton Sandspit. And it's an excellent place to go and view uh, most of those shorebird species that I mentioned earlier, particularly Eastern Curlew, Bartel Godwit as well. And there's regularly um, uh, uh, red knots and abacet and other things there too. It's a fantastic site. Uh, Kurigang dikes as well on the, on the southern side of that bridge. Uh, Ash Island is also an excellent place to go and see migratory shorebirds. There's a lot of uh, Pacific golden plovers and occasional eastern curlew seen there, as well as greenshank. And Hexham Swamp is a particularly good site for sharp-tailed sandpiper. Uh, down on the break wall at Nobby's Beach in Merriweather is also a good site for shorebirds. Uh, you're likely to see ruddy turnstones down there as well as a common sandpiper too. Um, and then Port Stephens Estuary is also uh, an internationally significant site for Eastern Curlew. It's the uh, best site actually. It's got the largest population of Eastern Curlew in all of New South Wales. So it's a very important site. And it's also got good numbers of Wimbrel, Bartel Godwit, and is the most important site in New South Wales for grey-tailed tatler as well. So some of those larger, uh, more coastal uh, shorebird species. And the best places in Port Stephens to see those birds are around Corrie Island and Windawapa Spit. You'll mostly see Eastern Curlew and Bartel Godwit. 
and same around Swan Bay there to the uh, west of the estuary. And then Soldiers Point is one of the good spots for seeing grey-tailed tattler as well. And as for Manning River Estuary, uh, it's also a nationally significant site for these five species. I think it's one of the only sites in New South Wales that is nationally significant for sandaling. There's regularly sandaling up at um, Manning River Estuary at Harrington and Farquhar Inlet. And it's also a great spot to see Pacific Golden Plover and Double Banded Plover in the dunes there, as well as Bartel Godwit and Eastern Curlew. And those are the two sites there. So Harrington uh, near the break wall there and there's several uh, sand spits there that you can uh, have a look at shorebirds on when the tide's out. And Farquhar Inlet is also an excellent spot. And Silas is going to cover some of the resident species that you're more likely to see in those two sites as well. So what can you do to help shorebirds? Well, the main problem here for shorebirds is disturbance. So when they're on the beach, they need to be able to do two things and that's feed and rest. So they need to be eating all the time so they can build up those vital fat and energy reserves to make those big migrations. So the less they have to fly up because they've been spooked by someone um, on the beach, the better. So best things you can do if you're using the beach, keep your dog on the leash. Make sure that you're using uh, following four-wheel drive and boat user guidelines when you're on the beach and keep your distance. We say at least 200 metres from the birds so that you're not disturbing them. And if you want to, you can uh, join BirdLife's uh, Shorebird Monitoring Program. You can email us at shorebirds at birdlife.org.au and become a volunteer. We can put you in touch with uh, our Shorebird Count Coordinators. And uh, if you're interested, you can also help spread the word by hosting a World Migratory Bird Day event. And there's details about that on our website. So that's it from me. And uh, thank you very much for uh, asking me to uh, present to you tonight and uh, look forward to your questions. Now I'd like to just introduce Silas Darnell. So Silas um, works with a number of agencies, uh, mostly national parks as a beach warden. Um, up and down the Hunter Mid Coast uh, region. And he's currently doing his postgraduate studies um, on shorebirds and avian predation. And he's got a wealth of knowledge. So I'd like to just introduce Silas to do his talk on uh, beach nesting shorebirds. Thanks, Silas. Uh, thanks, Regan. Thanks, Millie. Uh, so the beach nesting birds, though we don't have quite as many species that nest here. Just give me one second, I'll share my screen. Is everyone seeing that? Yep, so um, yeah, as Regan said, my job is to look after the beach nesting birds that nest in the Hunter, well, mainly the Manning area, but I've been lucky enough to be able to get down to the Cory Island site this um, season, which is pretty, pretty good down there. Uh, so they inhabit a mostly similar environment, except the species that nest here um, we're lucky enough to give them a home while they nest. And unlike the tundra, they can re-nest here. So their nesting season stretches from about uh, September till, till March, possibly. Uh, if it goes well, it's a bit shorter. Uh, so beach nesting birds are just that. They're birds that nest on the beach. So if you see in this left picture, there's a nest right in the middle of that picture. There's a, one chick and one egg just sort of sitting there on the sand. So the, their location of nest varies a little bit within species and a little bit between species. So both these nests are little turn nests and they, um, I'm trying to learn what, what makes them choose where they put their nest. So that's a question that we need to answer. But as you can see, they're pretty exposed. So this next picture is just a good example of how, how vulnerable and how exposed these nests are. This picture was taken at Cory Island by a trail camera, which gives us a bit of insight that we would never get if we were on site because as soon as the little terns see us coming, they'll fly up into the air and we don't get to see them interacting with their chicks. 
So a few things to take from this picture. You can see the big open sky, the close water. So they're not very far above the high tide mark. If you notice the temperature at the bottom of the screen, it says 56 degrees. So that's the temperature inside the camera on that day. That chick in the picture is probably about half a day old. And the bird behind it, if you look underneath it, it's, it's sheltering the eggs. Uh, sort of giving them a bit of airspace and a bit of shade to try and shelter them from the heat. So it's a pretty it's a pretty vulnerable environment, but they they can do okay with a bit of help from us, and they have historically done fine. But with growing populations, it becomes harder for them. So I'm just going to run through some of the species that nest on our beaches here in the Hunter and Manning area, and then um, talk about some threats and what we can do to help. So the first species is a little tern. They're a migratory species. There's a couple of populations in Australia. Uh, some, one of the populations nests here and the other population will nest elsewhere, uh, mainly in Southeast Asia. So the little terns, they nest in small colonies, uh, sometimes not quite big enough to sort of get the protection that they need. If it's a nice big colony close together, like Cory Island was this year, they managed to um, sort of protect each other by having good strength in numbers. Uh, they will pick a substrate that's really freshly um, turned over sand with not too much vegetation, pretty low lying typically, which unfortunately puts them at the mercy of high water. And then they'll uh, dig a little scrape on the sand, like you saw in the previous picture and in this picture, and they'll lay between one and three eggs and then incubate them for three weeks. And then the chicks hatch and they get fed pretty much flat out. They get fed white bait, which is what you can see this bird feeding there. And they get fed almost whole fish for their entire feeding period, which is about three weeks until they fledge. And at that time they can fly and they can start to feed themselves. And then around March, they'll um, typically fly back to their, their winter grounds. And so, yeah, these are two, two little chicks in the scrape there. And the parents would have been flying overhead when this picture was taken. So you can see they're pretty open to um, whatever might be passing by. So the next species is the beach stone curlew. Uh, the Hunter and the Manning area, the very southern end of their range on the east coast of Australia, the, there's a breeding pair in the Hunter that I don't think it bred this year, but has bred in years gone by. And there was one breeding pair in the Manning, but a dog ate one of them. So now there's one bird. Uh, perhaps more birds will fly in at some point, but we can just sort of wait. Uh, these are critically endangered in New South Wales, uh, but not listed. Really. So unlike the little terns, they'll feed on invertebrates. So this one here is having a feed of soldier crabs. And so you'll see them on the sand flats with um, other shorebirds. They're, well, there's only a few of them around. So they're pretty, I know it's always pretty special when you see them. Uh, the, next, the next bird I'll talk about is probably one of the easiest to identify. They're, We've got a striking red beak and black and white plumage and they're the pied oyster catchers. They nest in, in fairly good numbers in the Manning and in the Hunter area. And they'll, they, um, they're really easy to distinguish by their red beak. This, the foreground of this picture, you can see a black tip on the beak that, that'll show that it's uh, a juvenile bird. And this next picture is, it's an adult bird. So yeah, if next time you're down the beach, there's a good chance you might, might see one of these birds getting around there, nice and easy to see and pretty, um, yeah, pretty good looking birds. So again, they nest on the sand. Those eggs are about the size of a chook egg and they'll nest in a scrape, sort of a little bit higher than little terns, maybe with a bit of beach spin effects around it. And they have a defense mechanism that they'll um, they'll try to draw your attention away from the nest. And if there's chicks or the eggs are about to hatch, they'll, they'll make a bit of a racket and try to draw your attention away from the nest. And if the chicks hatch, they'll, um, the chicks will run to cover like this picture you can see on the right. And they'll sort of play hide and seek for as long as it takes for you to leave the area. 
And so that's fairly effective. If you don't see them go into hiding, they're pretty hard to find, but if you can sort of see where they go, uh, they, as you can see that one's, it's not too well hidden. Uh, the next bird is a sooty oyster catcher. They're not really a beach nesting bird, but I thought I should give it a quick mention because they're another oyster catcher, again, signified by that big red, orangey red beak, but all black. So that's another bird you might see, but you'll probably more likely to see them on the rocky shore. Uh, probably one of the most successful uh, beach nesting birds in our area is the red cap plover. They're not listed as endangered or threatened in any jurisdiction and they're residents that you can pretty much see all, the, all year. And they're, they're easily distinguished by their very nice red cap. This one is not fully developed. So you can see it's still got a little bit of brown on top, but you can see them, yeah, most of the time, they're pretty tiny. They're a little bit bigger than the redneck stint that Millie mentioned. So these guys might be a piece of toast and a half, possibly they're a bit bigger. And they also, they have a pretty interesting distraction method, but unlike the pied oyster catchers, they go a step more and they'll, they'll flap about on the ground like they have a damaged wing. So if you're walking along the beach and you see a bird that has a looks like it has a broken wing, there's a good chance it might be one of these birds just trying to draw your attention away from its nest. So if you do see that, just sort of follow it away and um, give it a bit of space and yeah, hopefully they can continue to do well, which is it's very surprising to me every time I see them because they're so tiny, but they still manage to hang in there. So their nests, they do just nest on sand again and sometimes out in the open, but they also will nest underneath a log, as you can see in this picture, which is, un the terns won't do that. They need to be able to fly straight off their nest. And I haven't seen a pied oyster catch a nest under there yet. Uh, so that's um, an interesting, I mean, it's a bit more cover, a bit more shelter from the elements. Uh, the next bird, it's not strictly a beach nesting bird, but definitely deserves an honorable mention because uh, they do nest uh, in pretty much the same area as the pied oyster catchers at Farquhar Inlet. There's often nests within sort of 10 or 15 meters of each other, uh, but they sort of pretty much nest everywhere and yeah, everyone will know them and they're pretty successful due to their high, crazy amounts of aggression they show to protect their nest. So where do these birds nest? So they, you would have already seen this map almost in um, Millie's presentation. So they do like the same sort of areas for feeding and inhabiting, but they're a little bit more specific with nesting. So the little terns, because they eat white bait, they need some good fishing ground. So they seem to prefer areas where there's sand on, sand in the middle and river on one side and ocean on the other. So at Harrington, they've got this big sand spit where they've got two, two choices for feeding grounds and the big wide open sand spit with not really any vegetation and plenty of that freshly turned over sand. And it's a similar story down at Farquhar Inlet. And these, these two inlets are mostly untrained, big, open, dynamic environments that constantly, constantly change and constantly provide good substrate for the birds. And the terns in particular have been monitored. Their nesting season's been recorded in the Manning for about 27 years, but definitely have been nesting longer than that. Uh, in the Port Stephens area, We've got the Corrie Island Winder Whopper area. That was a very successful nesting area for the little terns this year. It's, a pretty, it's pretty good, it's pretty low lying, nice fresh sand turned over with not too much vegetation. There's not really many threats there. There was a little bit of predation, but that's always to be expected, but there's no foxes, no dogs, no people and no four wheel drives, which is pretty good. And then the Soldiers Point area, there's a little island, Dowdy Island, the beach stone curlew pair have been recorded nesting there in years gone by. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they nested this year that I know of. And then the Warramai Conservation Lands have pretty extensive pied oyster catcher habitat. Um, they will 
potentially nest other areas. The little terns are pretty adaptable to new sand that might arise. So if a new environment comes up, they could easily turn up there from year to year. They're, I think they need to have that adaptability to survive really. And we did have a pied oyster catcher nest at Smith Lake this year, and I think possibly some around Foster. So that's the nest area. And then when they're feeding, you'll see little turns. Oh, I've seen them pretty far up, probably 10 k's from the river mouth. And then other shorebirds, the oyster, pied oyster catchers have been reported actually eating oysters on oyster racks pretty far up the river. So they will move around more to feed, but the nesting is typically on the close to the close to the inlets where the mobile sand environments are. So just as for shorebirds, the rest of the shorebirds, there's many threats. Uh, foxes are pretty pretty big and ongoing threat that can be managed pretty well, but it doesn't take much for for one animal to slip through the cracks. So this year at Harrington, we believe it was one animal took eleven nests on a few occasions, and it this animal appeared to be bait shy, so it didn't get baited, and then it eventually had had to be trapped but yeah just pretty much spoiled the spoiled the nesting season at Harrington um, and that's just one individual so foxes are ongoing problem for any any well man any Australian wildlife domestic dogs are pretty pretty problematic uh, not so much at Corrie Island but definitely really problematic at Farquhar Inlet where people just let their dogs roam free and I think maybe some domestic dogs come from town possibly, but they, um, they have taken many nests in the past and presumably will in the future. And it's hard to know with chicks because sometimes they just disappear. Uh, four wheel drives are a problem because of disturbance and also they leave big wheel ruts, which the little chicks before they can fly have been known to be caught in. And they're really hard to see. Uh, they're really hard to see when you're walking. So if you're driving a car, it's um, you wouldn't even really know if you ran over a chick. And then the nest areas, we try to keep them fenced. But if people do drive through the nest areas, then there's no way they would see a nest. Uh, cats are always a potential problem. I, I'm not sure about the hunter area, but the manning area, thankfully, they haven't been a huge problem in the past. Uh, the fireworks there, that's a picture taken in the nest area at Harrington during the fireworks um, last, oh yeah, last year. So 2020, early 2020. Um, so that sort of just symbolizes the human disturbance that we, um, we all want to be on the beach, particularly in their breeding season. And we just need to be mindful to share the area really. And um, they can, they can have had many successful breeding seasons and can continue to with just a few sort of simple actions. Uh, the picture of a crab, interestingly crabs have a bit of predation. They'll often take really little, uh, little turn chicks. I don't think once they start running, I don't think there'd be too much risk, but interestingly we see it every year. There's sort of at least one or two chicks taken by crabs. And then the overarching issue for all the beach nesting birds is the elements really. Uh, the wind can blow huge dunes up and cover nests pretty quickly. And then you can have storms that can, or hail can damage nests. And then the real risk is inundation from like flooding or spring tides. They can pretty much lose an entire colony within a couple of hours in a really big wet weather event. So that's, that's a constant threat they've had to deal with forever. Um, but it's sort of made worse by the extra threats that humans pose. So we try to we try to manage inundation if we can by raising raising nests. But ideally, we don't have to do that. Um, yeah, we just try and we hope they pick a good spot to nest, and we hope it doesn't flood. But it's um, yeah, sometimes it does. And then there's avian predators. So. There's many birds that will want a quick snack on the beach. The top left picture is a gold-billed tern. So they fly around looking down at the ground, like in that picture. 
and they'll swoop down and pick eggs straight up off the nest. So this is where a good, this is particularly for little terns, a good colony strength here will stop, well, at least mitigate some of the damage the goldbilled terns can do because the little terns can fly up and scare the goldbilled tern away. And then corvids and crows and ravens, uh, they're pretty opportunistic. If they see, we have to be quite careful if there's corvids around not to go into the nest area because they associate humans with food. And they're pretty smart. So we really don't want them to learn learn to where to find the eggs because they could potentially keep coming back and getting the eggs. Um, typically, there's not huge amounts of predation from corvids, but every little bit counts when sort of numbers are declining. And then silver gulls, uh, they haven't been a problem in recent years, but in years past, they've had pretty much whole colonies wiped out within a couple of days. I think during periods of bad weather, when there hasn't been much other food options, they can come in and do a fair bit of damage. So these are, these are native predators that typically the birds population should be able to deal with. But again, because their populations are declining, um, it's, yeah, it has a bit more of an impact. So what can you do and what can we, I do? Uh, it's much the same as that Millie mentioned with the shorebirds that they, thankfully they benefit from the same management actions and they inhabit the same areas. So we can pretty effectively share, share the shore. We can obey the four wheel drive rules and just drive between the tide marks and stick to speed limits and keep an eye out for chicks and actually any other birds for that matter. Because some of the birds even I've, I've seen it, they're very hard to see in a, in a tire track. Uh, following all dog rules, really not having dogs where they're not supposed to be um, and just trying to keep them away from the birds and definitely not letting them chase the birds. Um, we try to fence and signpost all the nesting areas. So we really try to make an effort to have the signpost signs there so people know why areas are fenced off. Uh, so if we can respect these areas and just give, give the birds a bit of space and then we can have our space. And then finally, educating your friends and family and strangers about the birds that nest on our beach is, um, I think you find it probably quite rewarding. I've, I know I've um, had a lot of good experiences telling some holiday makers yeah, why the fences are up and show them like make a little fake nest on the ground and show them just how vulnerable they are and people are generally pretty pretty willing to just do their bit if if you let them give them a bit of knowledge 